Hello friends, welcome to the class uh, of business to business marketing. Today we will begin with the third lecture. So uh, in the initial one first and second lecture we discussed, uh, we introduced the course of business to business marketing uh, where we also said that B2B markets are also called as the producers market uh, or the, uh, sometimes industrial market also. right? And uh, this is quite a large uh, market in size and uh, in comparison to the uh, consumer uh, markets. right? The beauty of uh, the business to business market is that it caters to both uh, exclusively the industries, the factories, the business houses and as well as it deals with certain products which are used also by the end consumers like the retail consumers. Okay. We also discussed about the type of uh, customers involved in the business market and uh, the different uh, kinds of goods uh, available in the business market. right? So today we will be continuing from there and we will be trying to understand how uh, you know the business to business market is different from the business to consumer market. right? So what exactly is the difference? So when I was going through the news today and I was, I was reading that the growth story in India is going to be in a very fast pace, right? especially in the B2B market. right? So this is a Crystal uh, Research report which states that India this year is going to grow very fast because of these certain sectors, for example, renewable, health uh, and largely driven by the business markets. Okay. This obviously this industry has a huge impact on the, in the on the lives of the people, the government, its policies, everything, right? So let's see uh, what exactly is the difference. Because when I say uh, consumer market, immediately you know things that come to your mind is like, for example, the consumer products like soft drinks, you know the you know, detergents, you know cosmetics. These are very easy to uh, recall. But generally, we cannot recall about B two B products. The simple reason being that they are not used directly by the end consumer, but it acts as only a facilitator to the producer. And with the help of these products or services, the producer then products the end product which the finally the consumers like you and me enjoy. Okay. So let us understand what are the key areas of difference. So the key areas of difference between the B2B and the B2C market is in terms of the market structure, the buyer behavior, the decision making process, the kind of products involved in the B2B and the B2C market, the price, the pricing strategies involved in the B2B and the B2C market, the distribution channel involved and the way the products are promoted uh, you know, in the B2B market and the B2C market and finally the purchasing decisions. So these are some key areas which uh, actually help in understanding or differentiating these two markets. So let us go one by one slowly and understand them at length. Okay. So, uh, you know, when I am saying uh, in terms of market structure, as you can see this, you know, diagram, uh, this is a small piece, a picture. So, you can see that there is, it seems like some industries are there and they are all close to each other. Okay. Now, the first point when I uh, talk about market structure is that consumer markets are geographically diversified, right? They are spread uh, across the whole uh, nation, right? But on the other hand, if you look at B2B marketing, the most of the markets are geographically concentrated, right? So that is why I've, I am sure I have shown this photo where you can see that the uh, you know the producers are all close by to one another, right? And uh, it's not that uh, there is no reason behind it. There is a there is a genuine reason why these uh, industries have to be concentrated in nature because they are generally close to the buyers, right? So, the sub seller and the buyer, when they are close to each other, obviously the cost of operations, the cost of transaction, the supply chain cost, they all come down uh, substantially. right? So, that is one reason which uh, has been uh, a major uh, you know, difference, uh, difference creator between these two markets. Then you have large number of customers. When I talk about a consumer product, the number of customers involved is huge, maybe they are in crores, uh, millions and crores, right? But on the other hand, if you look at the B2B marketing, the number of buyers will be fewer in numbers, but the volume of buying, if you see, will be very, very high, right? If uh, the if the per, uh, you know, unit consumption for a retail consumer is one or two, 
in that time the same uh, condition a organization may buy in thousands or hundreds or even lakhs okay the kind of competition we uh, look at is uh, in the consumer market is like a monopolistic competition where you know uh, there are lots of uh, producers a uh, lot of uh, you know uh, sellers in the market and on the other hand in the b2b space you find very few players so you don't find too many players because the simple reason is uh, is that there is a huge uh, competition in this market and you know uh, the entry uh, you know barriers are very high and even the exit barriers right so i'll explain each of them right interestingly one thing that you find is that in the consumer market the demand is direct so for example if hindustan unilever limited which is a uh, is one of the biggest uh, fmcg companies in the in india and especially in the world too right hindustan unilever limited now when it wants to make a forecast of its products which is like uh, soaps detergents beverages everything so they can make a you know uh, forecasting which is uh, more simpler because they can directly understand the consumers uh, psychology the the necessity the, the the change in trend and maybe you know even the uh, competition the number of competitors in the market and the kind of substitutes available in the market that is is relatively simpler but since uh, you know the b2b products are consumed by a producer who then produces a final product for the retail consumer or end consumer in that case the entire forecasting becomes a big challenge so what i mean to say here is for example let's say this is a case of a detergent right detergent now how many units of the detergent will be required we can just maybe say let's say 50% of the uh, hindustan unilever thinks 50% of the population now which is equal to maybe Fifty uh, percent is one uh, by two into the population of let's say one particular place is let's say uh, you know ten lakh people. So ten lakh. So this is if the let's say now if I multiply with one product cost being ten rupees. So I can just say five lakh into ten. So which is fifty lakh. So I can make a simple uh, calculation. But now look at it. Now the detergent is being produced in through a machine, right? so uh, in a there is a mold there is a proper production pro system uh, completely arranged now for that production process there are one machine can produce let's say uh, let's say 1000 uh, soaps per uh, let's say 1000 uh, or 1 lakh soaps per year okay now if 1 lakh soaps uh, per year it can produce let's say and here there is a requirement of 5 lakhs right so that means we simply will say that we require five machines right so how do you come to know now because you have come to know that there is a demand of 5 lakhs so uh, my one machine can produce 1 lakh uh, you know units uh, soaps per or detergents per uh, year so i will need at least five machines for that right but the question is not is not that simple right since you are not directly playing in this industry you do not know how to forecast the you know the sales of detergents for which your machine is required that is one thing and second you can't keep track as hindustan unilever limited can keep track of the market you cannot keep track just because you are less uh, you have less information in your hand right and one more thing is the demand if it changes let's say that there is a because of covid let's say there was a fall of 25% demand now this 25% demand fall fall in demand how will it be get reflected in for the business house or the producer in the b2b market how many machines should it now produce accordingly <clears throat> so so these are the challenges that they have to face because it's a not a direct demand it's a derived demand so you derive it for example a car manufacturer now a car manufacturer for example let's say there is a increase in the uh, demand for cars this year because last year uh, last, or let's say last year there was a shortage in the you know microprocessors and chips and that's that's why the number of uh, automobiles that could be produced was affected now if you see if that was affected then a car has several parts right so batteries let's say seats engine you have several parts now tires now everybody is connected to the car if suppose one car is sold then automatically these some x number of units of these also are sold so so this becomes a real challenge now 
कि how do we understand? Because this is not direct. So you have a indirect demand or a, you have to have a derived demand. So to calculate from this, from by understanding the number of cars that can be sold, your forecasting has to be done as a from a B two B perspective. I am saying. So this is a challenge. And the final point is the cross elasticity. Now what is cross elasticity? So cross elasticity is a change in response. Now when let's say there are two companies or there is a company which changes the price of its products. So when it changes the price of its products, what happens to its substitute products or what happens to its uh, you know uh, complementary products? So when you see uh, the B two C market, largely the products are substitutes in nature, right? So if one product increases, let's say if tea and coffee you know uh, are substitutes. And if tea prices are raised, then people will jump towards coffee. So they will try to drink coffee more than tea because the price has increased. So this is something which it says. So cross elasticity is nothing but del Q by del P. So del Q, which is change in quantity, de uh, depending on the change in price, right? But in case of a B two B market, it is a, it's a, it's basically they behave like complementary products. Now, what do you mean by complementary products? Now, let us say if you buy a, a printer, so or a car. So, when you buy a printer, the cartridge automatically is connected to the printer, right? So, if the price of uh, let's say cartridge is increased, so what will happen? So, there will be sales in the fall in the sales of cartridges, and automatically when there will be so fall in the sales of cartridges, it will affect the Uh, sales of the uh, printer or vice versa. If the printer increases its price, let's say, so there will be sell uh, decrease in the sale of printers, and when there is a sell uh, decrease in the sale of printers, there will be a less requirement of cartridges. So cartridges also get affected. So this is a case where complementary products are available. Now I have explained these terms. For example, I have used for example monopolistic competition. Now what is this? Many firms compete in the same space but for slightly different customer groups. now for example look at hotel now there are large number of producers no doubt about it or service providers now every hotel uh, tries to give you some security or space for uh, taking rest or something but is it true that we can compare all hotels at one go no it's not possible because certain kind of consumers will require a, a cost effective hotel somebody may go for a luxury so although they all are catering to the customers but they are set, uh, catering to different kinds of customers so the products cannot be termed perfect substitutes okay because here one is a poor man who wants to go to economical hotel and somebody is a rich man he wants to go to a very costly hotel okay derived demand as said increase in demand for education example increases the demand for professors so professors like us will be in higher demand if the demand for education increases there will be demand for computers infrastructure markers you know Uh, even pointers chalks notebooks school bags etc so this is a derived demand if just in this country suddenly the government increases the budget for education see it is not only education that is directly affected it is all the related industries complementary industries which are connected to this uh, you know to the education so they are all positively affected right cross elasticity of demand as i said is the responsiveness in quantity demanded for one good due to a change in price in another so it is positive for substitute goods like tea and coffee so if tea increases price the uh, demand will shift towards coffee but it is negative for complementary goods like printer and cartridge i said finally this point if you look I, when i said geographically concentrated right and this is geographically diverse why is it we have to understand there is a you know there is a you know theory behind it which comes from the transaction cost economics or largely you can understand it through the transaction cost right this theory was given by oliver williamson in 1975 who said that there are five determinants of the transaction cost right every company would like to reduce the transaction cost as much as possible so that the cost of the product can come down and once the cost of the product comes down automatically there will be more number of buyers for the product okay so in order to do that they have to be as close as possible they have to stay together they have to that is why if you see any mother plant like steel plant or any big plant which is called the mother plant then you will see that there will be lot of ancillary uh, units or industries around close to the mother plant why these industries will be supplying 
or supporting with the uh, different kinds of working components, you know, materials, parts to this mother plant, right. So, they have to be closed so that in case there is a sudden demand or sudden urgency or requirement, then they can immediately pass on to the products to the or service to the company and as a result, they also get a good amount of business and the buyer gets it at a much faster pace and a lesser price, okay. So, Williamson said there are 5 points as uh, you know which affects this transition cost. One is frequency, asset specificity it is called, specific assets also it is called sometimes, sometimes uncertainty, bounded rationality and finally, opportunistic behavior. So, these 5 points are ones which affect the you know uh, transaction cost of any, any firm. Okay. Now, uh, let me talk about these 3 first opportunistic behavior. So, when you talk about frequency, so it is like how many times you want to give order, right. So, every uh, organization, B2B organization, uh, you know, any business organization will give an order, right, to buy something. Now, how many times will it uh, place an order, right? That will depend on how much of space it has got and how much is that, you know, cost of ordering. So, and what is the cost of holding? So, all these different things will lead to its uh, taking a decision that how frequently it should buy, should it for example, if it is a very, uh, it is a product which can change very fast or you know the life cycle uh, is very short. In such a condition, the frequency of buying has to be more because they cannot hold it. If they hold it, then maybe this product may become obsolete and uh, the demand for this product may come down. So, that is one thing, frequency. Second thing that you talk about is uncertainty. Now, how much of uncertainty is there in the market? What is the level of uncertainty prevailing? For example, you see technology changes very, very fast, right. So, when technology is changing, new substitutes are coming into the market. What will happen to the earlier products? Will they, will they stay? Will they be out of the market? What will happen? For example, nowadays you can see now, you know, many different startups have emerged. Uh, which are providing specific services, right. Now, this has created a kind of uncertainty in the market for the existing large players who were earlier providing the same services. Now, in such a condition, here the government is encouraging startup, which is a good thing, right. So, competition will increase. Now, with increase in competition, how would the organizations, the, uh, the business firms, how would they, at, uh, you know, tackle this problem? Then uh, I will talk about opportunistic behavior. Opportunistic behavior actually is nothing but which uh, Williamson says that people or human beings are opportunistic in nature. So, they would try to maximize their benefit by switching their sides, okay. So, somebody they would not take a waste a moment to shift their sides in order to take an opportunity, right, or take advantage of the opportunity. So, this is a natural behavior, we cannot feel good or bad about it, right, it is a natural behavior. So, it is better to understand that it is the human psychology, this is how organisms are made. So, if this is the behavior, then how do you handle this behavior, how do you cater to this behavior? This is something that is uh, that has a significant relevance or a significant impact on the transaction cost. For example, let us say you are depending on a supplier and the supplier suddenly does not supply to you just because it feels that uh, you know you are paying a low price. So, so it, it sells its products to another buyer who is ready to willing to pay a higher price. Now, your entire supply chain is disrupted. So, how would you deal with this kind of situation? Then there is something like the two remaining are asset specificity. What it is saying? It is a degree to which an asset can be used for multiple purposes. Now, let us say you have uh, learnt about flexible manufacturing systems and all. So, when you talk about how an asset can have multiple utilities, right. So, more the utilities, the, the, the cost of the asset is spread across these uh, different utilities. But let us say a particular asset has been made for a particular purpose, let us say. In that case, if the buyer or the user does not uh, continue its uh, purchasing or buying, then what will happen to the supplier who has created the specific asset or a particular asset designed for this particular buyer? So, that will be, a, that will create a lot of trouble for the seller, right? So, example it says, this can be equipments designed for a particular function or labor 
train to form a single task, right? Examples are softwares, oil drills, jet liners, assembly lines, which are not easy or cheap even to be flexible or they cannot be easily uh, manipulated or they cannot be changed easily, right? So, these are specific uh, purpose uh, machines or you know technologies. So, it is very difficult in such a condition for to change or you know which is called in simple terms which we say in uh, you know uh, is switching cost. The switching cost is very high with such kind of machines or technologies, the switching cost is very high. And when the switching cost is very high, that means if you want to change, it needs a lot of uh, labor, a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, design changes, infrastructural changes and all these things. So, when you are doing it, automatically there is a heavy cost involved. So, firms would not like to do it unless there is a clear cut gain out of it. Now, look at this case. If a buying firm offers a contract to build a new gadget that has an unusual form and requires different kinds of materials. In such a case, a new and expensive machine must be custom built just to manufacture this gadget. Now, you want a gadget, you have ordered a gadget from me, right? Now, I am ready to uh, you know uh, make it, but to make that, I will need a specially designed machine for it, right? Now, since human beings are opportunistic, we said, so maybe if tomorrow you do not buy the you know gadget from me, then what happens to the entire investment I have made for this uh, machine and all, they are all wasted, right? So, these are the kind of risks involved that is why there is some contractual you know contracts or you know some legal uh, challenges that come in when you talk about specific assets. So, firms try to create build a contract or uh, have a legal binding so that you know one does not ditch the other, okay? The second point was bounded rationality, which uh, was given by Herbert Simon, right? Where he said human decisions differ uh, from economically rational decisions, right? Due to why? What is the reason? Due to cognitive ability, social limits, time constraint, and imperfect information. Example, let us take an example. Now, while purchasing in a store, you, you went to a store and you want to buy something. Now, you might not have information about the product or whatever is your level of information that will have an impact, right? Now, how much of time you have if it is an urgency? So, you may not be able to search well and maybe you may pay a higher price, right? Or, you know, what is the person's cognitive ability? Many cognitive ability is your mental ability. Now, what kind of mental ability he has or she has that also plays a very vital role in uh, decision making. And finally, maybe the behavior or the relationship with the store keeper or the salesperson can also have an impact. So, Herbert Simon had said that human beings suffer from bounded rationality. We all know that some of the best people have taken the worst silliest decisions in life and we get surprised. We feel how can he do that, right? Or she do that. Actually, this is something like a simple equation which can be uh, created by taking these factors like cognitive ability into social limits, into time constraint, into imperfect information, all these together, right? So, these are the few things that business it affects the business producers or the business organizations in a large way. So, they, you need to understand that business organizations, if they do not understand, then the cost of transaction will go up and once the cost of transaction will go up, it will have a profound effect on their profitability, their business relationship with their, uh, you know, uh, their partners. So, all these things, right? Now, coming to the second point which uh, we are going to talk is the buyer behavior. Now, when we are talking about buyer behavior, so what is the difference between the consumer market and the B2B market? So, this is a, you know, uh, product which is a consumer product and this is a lift truck as simple as you can see which is a business product because you do not buy a business, uh, you know, a lift truck for your home, right? So, the first thing that it talks about is teams, for example, uh, people from marketing, uh, finance, HR, uh, production, uh, IT, they all might be involved in the uh, buying process, you know, uh, in the of the B2B products, right? So, B2B product purchasing is generally done by something called a buying center. So, I am just writing here, I will explain buying center later on, right? Buying center. 
So, these buying centers are nothing but a group of people taken together from different functional areas who are involved uh, with a particular product, right. So, it could be just a decider who is the vice president or president of a company or uh, you know a shop floor mechanic who is using this product or you know a marketing guy who wants a different kind of design, anybody, right. Consumer markets are all about impulse buying largely. So, when you buy a chocolate or a detergent, you do not think much, right. You impulsively buy it because it is a low involvement product. It is a low involvement product. Generally, it is a low involvement product. Product. But these are all high involvement products. Why these are high involvement products? Because you see, because if you if you buy a machine and for some reason the machine does not function, the story does not end there. Rather, what happens is that it affects an entire line of production. For example, you see, if, if let us say this lift truck does not function, if there is some problem with the lift truck, then what will happen? The material handling will get affected. So, you cannot put the different uh, materials at the right places. As because of this, maybe searching a material during production will take a lot of time. So, there will be unnecessary wastage, which will all if you add up the idle time, the you know, uh, the, uh, the uh, idle labor and all, it will have a strong uh, financial effect, right. So, this is very important that is why there is a inter there is a rational buying decision because the marketers in the B2B space are extremely conscious and they are careful about what they are buying. They will never be affected by who is the celebrity, who is endorsing or who is telling about it, it is not important for them. And then third is it is there is no technical expertise obviously and here there is a large technical expertise involved, right. So, that is why we say the B2B marketers generally people who are from a technical background, they prefer it more rather than uh, you know uh, people who do not have a technical background. Because here you need to think like a you know engineer or a you know system uh, manager or somebody. So, you need to understand those words, those jargons, those codes better. This you can learn it through experience no doubt, but then these are taught to people who are from a background of uh, engineering or somebody, right. No reciprocity and here uh, reciprocity. What does it mean? That means, if you buy, if there is a manufacturer and there is a sell, uh, you know buyer, seller and buyer let us say. So, there is only one direction, right. So, the manufacturer sells it to the uh, C&F agent, for, to the distributor, comes from the distributor retailer, then to the buyer and the, which are, which is you and me. But there is no reverse, reverse flow, right. It happens which is called reverse logistics, but generally it is not cons to be considered. But what happens here? Here, every act of purchase or every act of buying has an involvement of negotiation has an involvement of reciprocity. That means what? The buyer, the seller would constantly seek information from the buyer to know what it requires. Why? Why this is happening? The simple reason being that, you know, this is a customized market. B2B market is a customized market. Here, everything is done according to the need and specification of the buyer. So, this is generally not a standardized product, it is generally a customized product. So, that is why a lot of discussion will happen between the buyer and the seller all the time, right. And last uh, uh, is there is no requirement of personal relationships in this case, uh, but since as I said in the earlier point also there is a lot of discussion going on, personal relationships are very, very important and in fact the entire sales happens through a personal relationship basis or relationship marketing is very, very important in a B2B space or B2B marketing rather in comparison to the consumer marketing, right. Okay, that is for the day. Thank you very much. So, uh, I hope you have understood what I have explained. Uh, we will meet in the next lecture. Thank you.